I've been crucified with Christ I've been crucified with Christ I no longer live but Christ lives in me We welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to another Bible study of the Apostolic Doctrine presented by the New Covenant Apostolic Church. And my name is Brother Tim Early, and I'll be leading the Bible study this evening in the topic of the apostolic doctrine of water baptism. We're not interested in what the Bible does not say, but we are interested in what the Bible does say on any given topic. The will of God is revealed by the Word of God. And if you want to know the, God's will, then you must know God's Word. And to be able to rightly divide the word of truth, you must allow the scriptures to interpret the scriptures. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. There are many voices today that say they are speaking for God. But the things they are saying contradict the Bible. In John 3 and 34, we read this. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. With all these different voices today, who are we going to believe? There is only one voice that you must believe, and that's the voice of the Spirit of God found in the book we call the Bible. In Psalms 103, verse 20, it says this, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. That scripture says that the word of God is the voice of God. And in Revelation 2 and 7, it says this, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Did God say in vain, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? In Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, and in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, these words are recorded. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus said in John 6 and 63 that his words are spirit and they are life. The words that Jesus gave to the apostles are the words of eternal life. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And in John chapter 6 and verse 68, Peter said this to the Lord. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And Jesus, praying in the garden, said this in John chapter 17 and verse 8. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. There is only one doctrine of salvation in the Bible, and it was given by Jesus Christ to the apostles. And he commanded them to go into all the world and to preach to everyone how to get saved and then how to stay saved. And we read about the commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Through the apostles of Jesus Christ, we have received the words of eternal life. And if you're following any person or group or denomination, that is not teaching the whole doctrine of salvation that was taught by the apostles to the first century church, then you have not received the true and faithful witness of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 24, verses 45 through 48, we read this, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, 
and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. And Jesus, speaking to the apostles, said this in John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And Peter, speaking of Jesus, said this in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The apostles preached water baptism as a condition of salvation everywhere they went. They were the eyewitnesses of the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And through the apostles, God has given to us a divinely inspired account of all things that pertain unto eternal life and godliness in the new covenant. That through their witness of these things, we also may have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And the apostle John had this to say in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. And the apostles gave warning concerning preaching any other gospel than that which was preached in the first century. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 9. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As I said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And Jesus, praying for the apostles in the garden in John chapter 17, verses 14 and 20, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And speaking of the apostles, in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, we read this. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptisma, meaning immersion, submersion, or to be emotionally overwhelmed. The root word of baptism is baptized from the Greek word pap baptizo. And this means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, that's an important word, wash, and to make clean with water. The first mention of baptism in the New Testament is the baptism of repentance administered by the prophet John the Baptist, who was sent to Israel under the Old Covenant, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, we read this, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And Zacharias, speaking of his son John, prophesied this in Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. 
And Jesus, speaking of John the Baptist, had this to say in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 14. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. And in Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we read this about John the Baptist. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. The baptism of repentance was preached to prepare natural Israel to receive their God, who was manifested in the flesh at the closing of the Old Covenant, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and to offer himself a sacrifice for many for the remission of sins under both covenants. In Romans 15 and 8 we read this, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. The baptism of repentance preached by John marked the beginning of the last days of the last generation of the Old Covenant age. And by contrast, it was the dawning of the eternal age of the New Covenant, which was established upon better promises. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 says this, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Those that had an ear to hear obeyed the call of John to repent, and their hearts were made ready to receive him of whom John said should come after him. And through faith in Jesus Christ, they would continue on to receive the remission of their sins through the blood of his sacrifice. Repentance comes from a remorseful heart of one that has stopped resisting the indictment of sin guilt and finally accepts the responsibility for it. And with the understanding that it is sin that separates us from God, they turn from their sin and turn to Jesus looking to be reconciled through the promise of the gospel. In Psalms chapter 51 verses 16 and 17, we read this about a repentant heart. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, we read this about the reconciliation through the gospel. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18, we read this, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Repentance is where we start, but repentance is not a one-time act. Repentance, along with its attitudes and works, becomes a way of life for the child of God. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, and 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, we read this, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible tells us that it is God's goodness and His willingness to save us that brings us to a place of genuine repentance. In Romans chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says this, And thinkest thou, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? 
Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, we read this, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. And finally, in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 9, it says this, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We read in Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, that all went out to John and were baptized. But we know that all were not baptized of John. But what the writer is telling us is that all that believed the words of John, they were baptized, confessing their sins. Luke chapter 7, verse 29 and 30. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. It was by faith and obedience to the preaching of John that they justified the word of God in themselves. And by their works of faith, they proved their faith in the righteous counsel of God's word. And like Abraham, their faith was accounted to them for righteousness. James has a lot to say about faith and works, and we can read some of that in James chapter 2, verses 17 through 19, and verse 24. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. See ye then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only? When John came preaching the baptism of repentance, the people first had to take the time to hear what was being said. Then they had to believe what they had heard, and finally by faith they had to obey the words of John by repenting and being baptized. It's the same for us today. In Luke chapter 7, verses 29 through 30, the text said that the evidence of their faith was seen in their obedience to the command to be baptized. And no doubt it was a command and not a suggestion. And likewise, the evidence of unbelief was seen in those that refused to be baptized. They all heard the same message, but it was faith and obedience that made the difference. It is implied that those who rejected the baptism of John were outside the will of God. It was not enough to only believe. They had to obey and be baptized, confessing their sins. If God commanded all to be baptized for repentance of sin, is it hard to believe that God has commanded all to be baptized for the remission of sins? Even Jesus gave us an example of baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. John said that he had need, need being the necessity or the duty to be baptized of Jesus. Ask yourself the question, do I see the remission of my sins as a necessity for myself? And we read in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Jesus said that baptism is a part of fulfilling all righteousness. Without water baptism for the remission of sins, the righteous will of God cannot be fulfilled in your life. The baptism of John was the baptism of repentance. It was not the baptism of the remission of sins, but the repentance of sins. Those that were baptized by John were baptized under the Old Covenant, and they were baptized again in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins from the day of Pentecost onward under the New Covenant. 
In Acts chapter 2 and 37 and 38, we read this. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And speaking about being rebaptized, Acts chapter 19 verses 3 through 5 shows us that they were rebaptized. And he said unto them, What then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's look at the scriptures concerning water baptism for the remission of sins in the New Covenant. Remission is the cancellation of a debt, a charge, or a penalty. The remission of sins is the forgiveness of sins. In the New Covenant, the remission of sins comes only by the blood of Jesus Christ through the act of water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, we read this, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And Acts chapter 2 and 38 shows that remission comes through baptism in the name of Jesus. The apostles received commandment from Jesus to preach, teach, and to baptize. In Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20. And if you want to know how the apostles interpreted Matthew 28, you just have to read Acts 2 and 38. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And let's continue on looking at some more scriptures in the Gospels and in the book of Acts concerning baptism. In Mark chapter 16 verses 15 and 16 we read this about baptism. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. In Acts chapter 8, verses 5, 12, 14 through 16, we read this when Philip went down to Samaria preaching the gospel. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in Acts chapter 10, verses 45 through 48, we read about Peter going to the house of Cornelius and sharing the gospel to the Gentiles. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. And in Acts chapter 19 verses 1 through 7, we read about Paul running into a group of men who had been disciples of John. And it came to pass that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, 
we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And in Acts chapter 22, verses 12 through 16, we read about Paul's own conversion. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Notice that not once in any of the scriptures is there recorded a single example of anyone being baptized for the remission of sins in any other name than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew 28, 19, the word name is in the singular sense, meaning there is one name for believers to be baptized in. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are titles and not names. Nowhere is it recorded in the Bible of anyone being baptized in the titles of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, we read this, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4 and 12 says that this one name is Jesus. And the name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. In Isaiah 44, 6, Jehovah said that he was the first and the last and the only God. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And Jesus says this in Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. They both say the first and the last. There can only be one first and one last, showing that they both are one in the same. In Isaiah 43 and verse 11, Jehovah proclaimed that he alone was Savior. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And we read in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 that they were looking for God, the Savior, to come in the first century, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, we read this about an exchange between Jesus and the Apostle Thomas. Then he saith to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. What did it mean for Thomas, who was an instructed Jew, to call Jesus his God? Did Thomas think that Jesus was another God other than Jehovah? The Jews' religion was strictly monotheistic, meaning they believed in only one God and their worship was exclusive to Jehovah, as found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 2 and 3, and chapter 34 and verse 14. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. 
Jesus, rebuking Satan, said this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Why didn't Jesus rebuke Thomas for calling him God? It was because Thomas spoke the truth when he called Jesus his God. Thomas knew that he was speaking to Jehovah, manifested in the flesh, when he said to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Now let's continue on looking at baptism in the epistles. And beginning at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, we read this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. When did you die to sin? The Bible says that we were buried with him by baptism into death. If you haven't been planted together in the likeness of his death, you also won't be in the likeness of his resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, we read this. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also of the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Some use this scripture to say that baptism is not necessary for salvation because Paul said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The scripture records Paul being baptized himself in the name of the Lord in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, and also Paul baptizing others in the name of Jesus Christ, as we read in Acts chapter 19 verses 4 and 5. Even there at Corinth, in this scripture, Paul said that he did baptize some. To say that Paul did not preach baptism as a condition of salvation is not accurate. Paul's own conversion and his actions as an apostle discredit that view. Paul was sent to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and he established churches as he went. And in every church he set in order and instructed the ministry to faithfully preach the gospel, to baptize the believers, and teach the disciples. Unity of the Spirit requires that all teach the same doctrine. Paul couldn't contradict what the Holy Ghost said through Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, 38 and 39, when, Paul, when Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Just as Jesus prepared and equipped the apostles to continue preaching the gospel after his physical absence, Paul established churches that would continue ministering the gospel message in his own physical absence. They had the whole message, and they had received it straight from the apostles. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, we read this about baptism. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Knowing that Egypt represents the bondage of sin in the Exodus story, and if all that came out of Egypt or sin in the Exodus story were baptized unto Moses in the Old Covenant, is it strange if all that come out from sin in the New Covenant are to be baptized unto Jesus Christ? In Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 28, we read this, For as many of you 
as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This scripture points out that if you have not been baptized into Christ, then you have not put on Christ. And if you have not put on Christ, then you are not in Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, we read that there is one baptism in the new covenant. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, the apostle Peter said this, which sometime were disobedient when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience, conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter, speaking about the flood of Noah's day and the eight souls that were saved by water, said that it was a figure of baptism in the new covenant. Notice what the scripture says. Baptism doth now save us. It's plainly stated, without water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, there is no salvation. And in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13, we read about the circumcision made without hands, the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, and the writer connects putting off sins with baptism. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Ask yourself the question, when were my sins put off? When did I receive the circumcision of my heart? And do you have book, chapter, and verse to support your answer? Let's continue reading with Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And Romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 again mentions the circumcision. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. If physical circumcision was required under the Old Covenant, according to Genesis chapter 17, verses 13 and 14, is it hard to believe that spiritual circumcision is a requirement under the New Covenant? The circumcision of the New Covenant is the circumcision that God has always desired for His people. The circumcision of the heart in the Spirit. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 16, we read this, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 6, the scriptures say this, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 4, we read this, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, it speaks of the new heart. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and give you an heart of flesh, 
and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, we read about the circumcision of the new covenant. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3, it says this, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So Colossians chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 says that it is in baptism that God performs the operation of the circumcision made without hands. It is in baptism that God washes away our sins and takes away our stony, calloused heart and gives us a heart to love and to obey Him. We have looked at many of the scriptures that speak about water baptism in the New Covenant. And we've covered some of the differences between the baptism of repentance and the baptism of the remission of sins. We read about the baptism in the Gospels and in the Epistles and the Book of Acts, and we found nowhere in the Scriptures recorded that baptism is not necessary for salvation. But on the contrary, the Bible records the apostles preaching baptism and commanding all that believed the Gospel to be baptized. And the works of the apostles that are recorded in the book of Acts only strengthen the necessity of water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The purpose of this study is to bring people to the reality that if you have not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, according to the scriptures, Acts 2 and 38, then your sins have not been washed away by the blood of the Lamb and you are still in your sins. The Bible has a lot to say about water baptism, and you must have a good understanding of the Word of God to answer the greatest question, what must I do to be saved? We hope to encourage believers to seriously study the Word of God and to read out of it what God has said from the beginning and to stop reading into it the traditions that men that have been developed through the centuries. This is the end of part one of this study. In part two, we will continue on with the scriptures and begin to reason through the scriptures about water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And if you have any comments or questions, you can email us at the New Covenant Apostolic Church at gmail.com. Thank you. I've been crucified with Christ. I've been crucified with Christ I know